Uh, so it's my pleasure to uh, welcome Daniel Sanchez to our speaker series. This is a pen penultimate meeting uh, for the year. Uh, and yeah, Daniel is right now a uh, AAA yes. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel right now is a AAAS Congressional Science and Engineering Fellow uh, in DC, uh, but yeah, he got his undergraduate degree in chemical biomolecular engineering uh, at UPenn. And uh, then uh, his PhD uh, at, at, at Berkeley in uh, Energy and Resources, uh, and then spent a postdoc uh, at uh, Stanford, uh, where he was at the Carnegie Institute for Science in the Department of Global Ecology, working with people like uh, Chris Fields and Ken Caldera. Uh, and he also put in some time uh, working for Hillary for America oh, yeah. on the Climate uh, and, uh, and, and, and Environmental Working Group. Uh, and so he has something like 12 publications in, in, in journals like. Uh, nature, energy, nature, climate change. Uh, all of his work has been basically on getting uh, carbon out of the air, out of, out of our system, and he's going to tell us more about that today. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I don't normally talk about um, working for the Hillary Clinton campaign. We can um, pour one out for that. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to, um, to be able to speak with all of you today. Um, I've been following Princeton's work in the kind of the energy, climate, engineering, and public policy space for um, essentially as long as I've cared about these things. So, uh, you know, some, some great faces in the room today, some, some really great work. And um, I want to tell you about some of my work that kind of uh, sits at the intersection of um, technology and policy. My background is in both chemical engineering um, and kind of energy systems analysis and energy modeling. Um, and we're going to talk about near-term opportunities to develop and deploy carbon dioxide removal in the United States. So this is going to be um, the most simple diagram we walk through today. And this is, uh, this is the most basic way that I know how to describe what a, um, a carbon removing bioenergy system looks like. And that is called bioenergy with carbon capture and sequestration, or BECCS, or BECCS. Um, I will probably refer to it as BECCS for the rest of the discussion today. But the basic idea here is that when biomass grows, um, it, 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 it grows based on uh, carbon that comes from the air. This is uh, through photosynthesis, fixes CO2 from the atmosphere. You then harvest that biomass, um, transport it to somewhere where you're doing an energy conversion process. And this can be any different kind of energy conversion process. And you really create two different products. Um, the first of those is your energy product, just like you do with traditional bioenergy. You're making a transportation fuel. You're making electricity or heat. And at the same time, you're also creating um, a pure stream of carbon dioxide that can be compressed, um, transported, and sequestered underground into permanent geologic uh, storage. And uh, it, the basic idea here is that this is bioenergy with carbon capture and sequestration, or BECS. Of course, it's a lot more complicated than that. And um, the way I like to kind of introduce BECS systems and the way I like to kind of talk about this technology is um, to really talk about it as a class of technologies rather than a single one. And it's one that really consists of a number of different, different subsystems. That includes um, what you consider kind of your upstream biomass harvesting, your biomass cultivation, your biomass growth. That could include things like growing perennial grasses on marginal land. It could involve things like um, forestry residues or, thing, or, or crop residues or agricultural residues. Um, right now, it involves growing corn and growing soybeans to make uh, transportation fuels in the United States. Um, but there's, there's a lot of different kinds of energy crops and a lot of different sources of biomass that we might be able to use for energy. Um, the second stage of that process, it really involves your energy conversion process as well as your carbon capture. And this is, as I mentioned, um, you can make all different kinds of energy products. You can do combustion to make heat or electricity, um, fermentation to make um, a biologically processed transportation fuel, um, anaerobic digestion to make a gaseous fuel, um, gasification makes a number of different things as well. Um, at the same time, again, you produce that um, semi-pure stream of CO2 for ge dedicated geological storage, as well as um, energy products that intersect downstream in energy markets. And um, again, there are lots of products here, lots of markets, and also, I think importantly, lots of different scales. Um, these facilities can be one megawatt, they can be 10 megawatt, they can be um, a gigawatt. And uh, it's, it's, it's really uh, the, the size of a BEC system that you might deploy is really dependent both on economics and technology. Um, 
But let's start with what we know about these technologies. And I think what we, what we can say is likely how valuable BEX is in climate change mitigation. And to do that, uh, to, 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 to illustrate that, I'm going to walk you a little bit through um, some recent scenarios that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change put out um, in their most recent um, fifth assessment report, which was um, maybe a year or two ago. And these are the scenarios that they use to think about stringent climate change mitigation um, in working group three, which, um, which really focused on the response to climate change. So the um, IPCC considered 76 scenarios that were consistent with um, a two degree Celsius temperature rise or less, which was the goal of the Paris Agreement um, from, uh, from 2016. And um, in these, 70, these 76 scenarios, what I'm walking you through right here is a picture of both net emissions and gross emissions. Um, net emissions being the actual amount that goes into the atmosphere. Gross emissions um, include um, the total amount of CO2 emitted, but also the total amount of CO2 removed, which is shown again below zero as they've realized negative emissions. So um, I think the most important thing to note here is that the median value of bioenergy with CCS deployment in these two degrees um, Celsius scenarios um, was, was um, over 10 gigatons, 10 billion tons per year of, um, of BEX deployment, of carbon removal from the atmosphere, um, really starting as early as 2020 or 2030, but then reaching a remarkably large scale starting in 2040 and going all the way to 2100. Um, we are, the median is again, yeah, 12 gigatons of CO2 per year in the year 2100. Um, this is a really, really large amount. And it involves, um, it involves scaling up and um, really kind of a, um, entirely different industries than, than what we have today. Again, we see that this, these negative emissions compensate for positive emissions from um, whether they be from fossil fuels, they be from industrial processes, they be from transportation, they be from other land use changes. These are the hard to decarbonize sectors. Um, and these, these kind of these cost optimized stylistic scenarios um, say that BEX is going to be really valuable if we care about doing stringent climate change mitigation. Um, just to put that in a little bit more of perspective, this is just one scenario right here. Instead of the 76, this is just RCP 2.6. Um, RCP 2.6 has about three gigatons of carbon, about um, 10 gigatons of CO2 per year of BEX by the end of the century. That's equivalent to 30% of current global emissions. Um, worldwide, from all sources, economy-wide, about 30% of that needs to be matched in scale by removal by the end of the century. Um, just by the, before the year 2050, the amount of capital investment is about $2, bill, $2 trillion going into these technologies. Again, these technologies that are relatively new and we know relatively little about. Deployment starts in about 2020, and you're building the equivalent of about 50 modern and efficient coal plants um, per year by the year 2040. Um, when you're talking about scaling up X. So this is, um, this is big and this is real, um, and, this is, and this is valuable if you care about um, fighting climate change. Um, unfortunately, um, our current deployment of BEX is roughly one million tons per year, um, not billion, million. Um, and so this is um, roughly 0.01% of your median 2100 deployment. Not to put too fine of a point on it, but it's very, very small from where we need to be right now. Um, so this is a project in, um, in Illinois, uh, in central Illinois. It's capturing CO2 from a, um, a corn ethanol facility, um, the, probably the largest corn ethanol producing facility um, in the world. And uh, it is a partnership between Archer Denos Midland, who owns the corn ethanol biorefinery, uh, Schlumberger, and the US Department of Energy. Again, putting 1 million tons of CO2 um, underground using bioenergy um, with carbon capture and sequestration. So where does this leave us now? Um, a number of groups have looked at BEX deployment, have thought about how we can deploy BEX, have thought about the uncertainties associated with these technologies. Um, and in the fifth assessment report, IPCC said something like, um, you know, the technologies and the methods are uncertain and there are challenges and risks and they have high confidence in that. Um, at the same time, the National Academies came out and said, um, we know there are risks, but we think there's a real value to this technology and carbon dioxide removal is ready for increased research and development. Now, it doesn't say demonstration, it doesn't say deployment, but they came out in 2015 and said it's ready for increased R&D. 
And actually, um, at the tail end of the Obama administration, um, the Department of Energy, through the Secretary of Energy Advisory Board, I know some of the folks here were involved in it, um, they were charged with um, designing a research development and demonstration program, really thinking about how we can scale up negative emissions technologies. Um, and this is really all motivated by the understanding that a lack of technological, a lack of commercial maturity of these technologies hinders their potential deployment. Um, and this is really how I frame my research. And so um, in, the, in light of the remarkable need we have to develop and deploy BEX technologies and the low commercial and technological maturity of BEX, um, I'm thinking about near-term opportunities to research, develop, and demonstrate these technologies, thinking about how we can use existing infrastructure, existing technologies, existing policies, and existing institutions. And that's what I really want to hope, hope to take you through today. Um, that looks like two different things. Um, when you're talking about existing infrastructure technologies and policies, we're going to be, um, talk about the opportunity to capture CO2 and sequester it from existing biorefineries in the United States. And when you're talking about policies and institutions, we likely won't get to this today just because of time. But I've done a lot of work thinking about how we can also design um, federal research and development programs across the U.S. government, um, leveraging um, the abilities of different agencies and their, their authorities and their expertise um, to really start researching and deploying these technologies. So let's get started. Um, we're going to talk again about the near-term opportunity that I find to capture CO2 from existing biorefineries in the United States. And um, I'll take you a little bit through the motivation for this. So, when you talk about carbon capture and sequestration, there are generally three costs that people consider. The first is the cost to capture and compress carbon dioxide that comes off of an energy process. The second one is the cost it takes to transport that carbon dioxide from the point where it's captured to the area where you need to sequester it. And the third one is actually the cost of you know, drilling a well and putting the CO2 on the ground and paying for the sequestration. Um, it turns out that um, no matter how you look at it, capture is typically the largest cost when you consider carbon capture and sequestration. Um, and uh, the primary reason for that is that um, CO2 is, uh, it, 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 there are relatively few pure streams of CO2. You know, right now it is 0.04% of the air. Um, if it comes out of a coal plant, it's maybe 12 to 15%. Um, of CO2 in the flue gas. If you're capturing it from a natural gas plant, it's usually a little bit lower, maybe 8 to 10%. Um, there's a rel there are rel relatively few places in the world where you have a pure stream of CO2, where you don't need a costly solvent, a costly sorbent, um, or a lot of energy to do that kind of capture process. Now, it turns out that when you're making ethanol from a biorefinery, this is one of the exceptions. And so there are a number of different um, small industrial processes where the cost of capture is relatively low. It involves um, installing a compressor, installing a pump, you know, it deployed existing technologies essentially to turn the CO2 from ambient pressure up to um, a supercritical fluid where you can put it into a pipeline and transport it. Um, and so um, the estimated break-even capture costs for these industrial processes, things like ethanol, things like fertilizer production, is generally $30 per ton of CO2 for, or less. And that is, again, to, to have compressed supercritical fluid, CO2 um, from your biorefinery. Um, the second motivation is that we can use existing infrastructure and existing, um, and existing deployments right now. Um, so it turns out that we already capture some CO2 from biorefineries in the United States. One of them is this facility right here that I pointed to you before. Um, this is in Decatur, Illinois, where they're putting a million tons of CO2 into a saline aquifer every year. Um, but we're actually also capturing CO2 for other merchant CO2 markets um, from biorefineries. Some of these look like beverage carbonation. Some of them look like dry ice. There's a number of markets that will pay for CO2 in the United States. And again, ethanol is one of the easiest places to source these things. The current merchant market is approximately 10 million tons of CO2 per year. Um, but at the same time, um, it turns out that there is a, unfortunately a spatial mismatch between the places where we produce ethanol and the places where we might want to put CO2 underground. Um, so this is a map 
Um, all the dots here are the existing biorefineries in the United States. These are primarily co processing cornstarch to make ethanol. Um, there are roughly 200 biorefineries out there, and they're really concentrated, again, in the, in the Midwest and the Upper Midwest right here, kind of the, 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 the corn belt, for lack of a better word. Um, there are over 200 existing biorefineries, and um, just about 120 of them are not within 50 miles of a site where you can do CO2 injection. I'm showing that here. This is a rough map put together um, by the National Energy Technology Laboratory. It's a map of where we think saline aquifers are, where we can put CO2 underground. And again, there's this, there's this, unfortunately, there's this big gap here in the upper Midwest where we have this cheap CO2, but we don't necessarily have, um, um, we don't necessarily have a place to put it underground. Um, but again, this points towards the idea of um, using existing infrastructure. This is, these are technology plants that we know how to build. We've been producing ethanol at commercial scale for 30 years in the United States. We currently make about 16 billion gallons of um, ethanol per year in the United States. Um, that is, by volume, about 10% of our transportation fuel demand. By energy, maybe 6 or 7%. Uh, and it's, it's not insignificant. And actually, the amount of CO2 that comes off of these biorefineries is roughly 45 million tons of CO2 per year. Um, again, that's about 1% of our US CO2 emissions. Um, so not um, a remarkably large, but it is actually an order of magnitude more than we put into CCS right now um, worldwide in saline aquifers. We put about 4 million tons of CO2 um, underground per year. So, Given all this motivation, what I focus on here is um, really trying to understand the costs and the abatement potential of doing biogenic CO2 capture, compression, transport, and sequestration from the existing biorefineries that we have in the United States. And I do that through a few different methods. One of them is process engineering to estimate the amount of CO2 that's available, how much the capture, compression, transportation, and sequestration might cost. Um, the second one of those involves spatial optimization. So using a technique known as integer programming to design CO2 transport networks. Uh, and the third one is really life cycle assessment to understand how much CO2 we're putting underground and how this might, how this might be incentivized by existing or proposed policies. Um, and I will put all of those together and hopefully uh, you guys will find the results uh, pretty interesting. Um, so let's get started. Um, I'm starting right now. This is a model of um, how much it's going to cost to capture and compress CO2 at, a, again, the, the 216 existing biorefineries that we have around the United States. And there are really two things that vary here. So on the, on the y-axis here, we're showing the capture cost. On the x-axis, we're showing the total volume of CO2 emissions coming from each one of these plants. And then, again, it's, um, it's, it, the density is, um, is the, is the, is the z-axis here, the number of plants. We're really finding two things affect the cost of carbon capture at these biorefineries. Um, the first one is economies of scale. As you build a larger plant, um, you can, um, it is cheaper per unit to, to build a bigger pump, to build a bigger compressor, and therefore you find that the larger, um, the larger biorefineries with, um, with, um, with more CO2 emissions have lower costs. Um, the second thing we vary is actually um, electricity costs. So this is, this is really basic. We're just varying the electricity costs of industrial electricity taken from um, the Energy Information Administration. And we find that it drives a little bit of variability as well. But I think what's important here is that um, really the majority of CO2 emissions, about 60% is available to be captured and compressed, ready to put into a CO2 pipeline for under $25 a ton um, in the United States. Um, just to, just to, just to um, put that in context, most people think the capture cost from a coal plant in the U.S. is at least $60 a ton, likely closer to $100 a ton right now. Um, so it's a lot cheaper to go after these industrial sources. It's a lot cheaper to go after ethanol right now. Um, and we find I think 90% of the CO2 is actually available under $30 or $32 a ton. Um, it's a really low cost CO2 resource, regardless of the actual size of the biorefinery. Um, again, you're just installing compressors and pumps. Um, now, what I want to show you is, again, the, the second part of what I focused on, which is these using integer programming to build CO2 transportation networks, taking the CO2 from where it's produced at the biorefinery to where it can be sequestered underground um, for permanent geologic sequestration. And so what I'm going to show you is we're going to simulate a number of different credit prices. This is a payment 
for a dollar of, or of a dollar per ton amount of CO2 put underground. Um, and it's a, it's a direct subsidy to a producer. And um, we're going to see um, what, the, uh, um, what the ideal system build is, what the optimal CCS network looks like um, for these different credit prices um, across the United States. Uh, and so we are optimizing this system. The red plants are shown, or the red dots here are the biofuel plants, similar to what I show you, showed you before. Um, we, def we define a transportation network. That's the, the solid black lines with um, um, following existing pipeline rights of way. This is from um, a Department of Transportation pipeline database. Uh, and then we, again, we consider a kind of a network of places where we can do CO2 injection on top of these saline aquifers around the United States. Um, again, based on estimates by, from the National Energy Technology Laboratory. And so we are finding, using an optimization method, the cost-effective way to capture and transport the CO2 and sequester it given a given credit subsidy price or given uh, a, a sequestration credit. So let's start with the, 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 the smallest subsidy we consider. I mentioned it's probably about $20 to $25 per ton to capture and compress the CO2. If you give a credit for all CCS of $30 a ton, uh, you start relatively modestly. Um, you start right around here in the, in, the, uh, in the Midwest, in Iowa and in Indiana. You put about 6 million tons of CO2 underground per year from 10 buyer refineries. Um, and it's 400 miles of CO2 pipeline that ends up getting, that ends up getting built. Um, I'll zoom in onto that here. So this is, again, just a shot of the upper Midwest here. And we're seeing that you build essentially two integrated pipeline networks that are close to existing or close to saline aquifers. Um, conveniently, the Decatur project in Illinois um, is actually that white dot right down there. Um, so there's a reason why this was a good place to try to figure out how to do CCS on, on fire refineries. Um, there's low cost electricity, it's a very large plant, it has low capture costs, it's already on top of a saline aquifer. Um, and so that's why the Illinois project um, took, uh, took its form. Um, so the largest pipeline you build is an 8-inch pipeline. That only, that only runs, um, transports about a million tons of CO2 per year. So it's, it's, rel it's relatively small here. Um, apparently I skipped to the next slide. So, um, when you, when you get to a credit price of $60 a ton, this is where you really start to see interesting things occur. So again, out of the 45 million tons of CO2 that's emitted per year, um, about two-thirds of that can be captured and put underground cost-effectively from 106 biorefineries, so about half the biorefineries that exist in the United States. You're building 4,300 miles of CO2 pipeline, and I think what gets really interesting is you're, really, you're starting to build these integrated pipeline networks um, that allow you to exploit these low-cost resources that are near each other and take advantage of the economies of scale in pipeline transportation to, um, to move the CO2 to where it can be put underground. Um, this, is, this is just a zoom in on that in the, in, the, in the upper Midwest. This pipeline right here is 22 inches and it moves um, roughly 12 million tons of CO2 per year, again following existing pipeline, pipeline rights of way. And we're getting a lot of, um, we're getting a lot of CO2 capture, um, a lot of transport, both um, between and then on top of the, of the saline aquifers um, in the um, kind of this part of the Midwest and then the upper Midwest moving it into the Dakotas over here. Um, at $90 a ton is where you really see kind of the vast majority of CO2 captured. Um, again, 40 million tons out of the 45 that's emitted, um, you know, well over two th or, you know, well over three quarters of the biorefineries and, and seven miles uh, a 7,000 miles of CO2 pipeline. You start doing this in, you know, these, these smaller plants that we have kind of in the Northeast, even the Pacific Northwest and in the South. Um, you get kind of a mixture of integrated pipeline networks and kind of one-off um, CO2 capture projects that are taking advantage of um, a relatively high carbon price of $90 a ton. Um, and again, you really have a, a really filled out CO2 pipeline network um, through the upper Midwest um, to take advantage of this opportunity. Um, $120 a ton looks a lot like $90 a ton, um, in part because you really run out of CO2 to capture. Um, you know, you're getting the vast majority of it already between the $60 to $90 a ton time frame, and so it doesn't, it doesn't change too much. Like your largest pipeline is, again, 22 inches. It's that one right there, um, built, uh, moving uh, 12 million tons of CO2 per year. Um, 
Now, what we can do from these results is that we can build um, spatially optimized biorefinery supply curves. And so this is for the number of different credit price scenarios that I mentioned before, between $30 and $120 a ton. We can actually cap calculate the total cost of carbon capture, transport, and sequestration from every single biorefinery in the United States. Um, and, and, and a few things pop out here. Um, one is that um, really, you know, the vast majority of CO2 can be, uh, can be captured and compressed for under $75 a ton um, and transported to where it can be put underground. The second thing is that, you know, as you start to build um, as, as, uh, more and more integrated CO2 networks, um, your transport costs come down as well and you're allowed to access more and more of the available CO2 resource. Um, but at, right now you, you start with the low cost um, the low cost emission sources at low credit prices and you, you build in kind of the inframarginal ones over time. Um, another way we can think about this is actually not at the facility level but at the system level. Again, this is just walking through the credit prices from 30 to 45 to 60 to 75. Um, you can calculate um, the total amount of available abatement um, from biorefineries in the United States um, using these optimization methods. Um, I say I've focused so far on payments per dollars of, um, of a dollar per ton of CO2 stored, and that's the sequestration credits that I mentioned before. You can also do this on a life cycle level and calculate the abatement. Um, what you're doing there is you're considering the electricity also used for compression of that CO2. Um, that, that emits some residual amount of emissions, but we find that abatement and sequestration are relatively similar. You abate a little bit less because you emit some CO2 when you run your compressors. Um, but otherwise, whether you're considering this on a life cycle basis or not, um, there's a relatively similar opportunity that we can find um, to capture the CO2. Um, so this is, this is just one more way of thinking about this. This, was, this is just the $60 per ton scenario, but I'm breaking out the cost between capture, transport, and sequestration. And um, this is a relatively different way of thinking about the costs and the construction of CCS from um, the very kind of large centralized view that we've thought about before. Um, in the past, we used to think that capture was the vast majority of to overall CCS costs. Um, and sequestration rel was relatively small and transportation was relatively small. What we find here is that transport is actually a relatively high part, a relatively large part of the overall cost of CCS. And then again, that's because um, we have these, these smaller biorefineries with smaller volumes of CO2 um, and large fixed costs for building CO2 pipelines. Um, and one more thing that I just want to say here is that when I, when I talk to bio biofuel producers, um, you know, they're interested in this right here, but what they're also interested in is this gap between the credit price of $60 a ton um, and how much their overall cost is. Um, because really this, this is a financial opportunity for, um, for biofuel producers to make extra revenues um, given a proper policy incentive that might be given to them. Um, so in this scenario right here, the, the annual profits are about $635 million um, dollars per year. Um, that's a relatively large amount. Um, we're talking about, um, I, I should know the dollar per gallon amount, but I don't. Sorry, guys. Um, the, it's essentially extra money that can be captured by these producers if they, um, if they were to take advantage of this network. Um, I'll just, I'll just uh, conclude on this issue just by kind of talking about uh, transportation costs that we identify. Again, we find transportation costs up to about $20 a ton um, system-wide, but we find that, um, well, we find, we, find, we find a few different things. If you look on the right-hand side, we find that uh, trunk pipelines, you know, the really large pipelines, the, the integrated pipelines that are moving large volumes of CO2, they exhibit economies of scale as you go to larger and larger networks. The, the costs go down. Feeder, net, feeder, tr feeder pipes do not. And the reason there is that as your credit price gets higher, you're moving more and more marginal sources onto the integrated pipeline network. And so you're paying a lot for like those, you know, the, the first 20 miles of a little small three inch CO2 pipeline to get to that integrated CO2 pipeline network. Um, you know, overall, we find, again, uh, system-wide um, carbon transport costs under $20 a ton, which is um, higher than the kind of the current model and paradigm suggests, um, but, but um, definitely um, nothing outside of kind of the, you know, the ordinary in terms of what we think about for um, overall CCS costs. Now, I want to tell you why I think this is exciting. 
um, because we have a number of different policies in the United States um, that can either make this happen or are surprisingly close to make this happen. Um, and we're, we'll, so we'll talk about three different kinds of policies that might um, help make this vision of carbon capture from existing biorefineries come, into, uh, come to fruition. The first one is carbon policy. The second one is carbon sequestration policy. And the third one is kind of low carbon fuels or renewable fuels policy. Um, so um, I'm in Congress right now. Uh, I work in the US Senate for um, a senator from Colorado. And he was a co-sponsor of a bill called the Future Act, which provided and revamped an existing um, tax credit that was passed during the Recovery Act in 2009. Um, to increase the dollar amount paid for carbon sequestration, um, as well as to um, make it easier for facilities to qualify. So um, prior to this year, um, there, were, there were some um, folks, primarily enhanced oil recovery operators, that were getting about $10 a ton in a tax credit to put CO2 underground. Um, this was something, again, passed during the, the stimulus in, the, in 2009. What, what, what was done was that, um, that tax credit was expanded and increased um, in a few really important ways. One is it pays up to $50 a ton for dedicated geologic storage. That includes, put, for example, putting CO2 into a saline aquifer. Uh, it goes up to about $35 a ton if you use it for enhanced oil recovery. Um, the second thing that it really does is it, it actually lowers the eligibility threshold. So before, you had to, you had to emit at least 500,000 tons of CO2 per year to qualify for this tax credit. And that puts the vast majority of biorefineries um, under the facility size. In this case, if you're doing permanent, permanent geologic sequestration, the threshold was lowered to 100 million tons per year. If you're doing carbon utilization, it's actually down to 25,000 uh, tons per year. Um, it also, again, uh, expanded the, um, the available technologies that could get this tax credit. Direct air capture technologies, another way of sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere, also qualifies, though I don't think people think it's really in the money yet. Um, and uh, utilization, um, paid for on a life cycle basis, um, also qualifies for this tax credit. And um, quite surprisingly, when we passed, um, we passed a 20, an FY 2018 budget in February of 2018, um, these tax credits were included. Um, and so now there is a 12-year tax credit that pe folks have about eight years to qualify for that will pay up to $50 a ton um, to capture and compress um, any source of CO2 that qualifies in the United States. Um, and this is a pretty big deal, um, especially given the economics I've talked about for putting CCS on ethanol right now. Um, so there was a group of folks that really um, that, that advocated for this. It was called NIORI, the National Enhanced Oil Recovery Initiative. Now, following the passage of 45Q, a few days later, again, February 23rd, um, they expanded their coalition and they rebranded their initiative, their coalition. They're no longer co called the National Enhanced Oil Recovery Initiative. They're called the Carbon Capture Coalition. And um, importantly, they also added a number of different new members. Um, the, um, um, two members that I think really stand out here. One is the Renewable Fuels Association, the largest ethanol trade group in the United States. And the second one is the National Farmers Union, the, the second largest um, um, group of farm, of, of, of farm trade groups in the United States, um, both of which think there is now an economic opportunity to capture CO2 from biorefineries to create profits for their members, whether those are biorefineries or whether those are farmers. Um, and you know, the, the, uh, the Carbon Capture Coalition has gone so far as to host Hill briefing for congressional staff, really focusing on um, the opportunities to capture CO2 from ethanol. Now the second, um, the second policy that I think is really important um, is a more of a life cycle policy, and these are carbon abatement credits. Um, so again, this doesn't pay for a dollar per ton of CO2 stored. It pays for a dollar per ton of CO2 abated. Um, and here, we have um, the shiny example of the California Low Carbon Fuel Standard. So the, the California Low Carbon Fuel Standard is a transportation fuel policy um, that um, decreases the carbon intensity over time of a pool of transportation fuels. And uh, fuel producers that make particularly dirty fuels have to pay more. And uh, fuel producers that make clean fuels that are sold in California um, can um, essentially capture uh, a subsidy from these tradable permits called um, uh, abatement credits or um, LCFS credits. Now, 
It's an uncertain price, but um, for the past several years, the price has hovered between $75 a ton of CO2 abated and $125 per ton of CO2 abated. Um, there's currently a price cap of about $200 a ton. And what's really exciting is that actually this meeting happened on Thursday. Um, the, the Air Resources Board in California is in the process of not only extending the program through 2030 and making it more stringent, which will cause prices to rise, but they're in, they're in the process of adopting a quantification and a permanence methodology for carbon capture and sequestration, which will explicitly pay for pathways um, to produce tr liquid transportation fuels that include carbon capture and sequestration. Um, it's likely that these will be adopted by the end of the year, and again, the, the, it's likely that the low carbon fuel standard will be extended through the year 2030. Um, and with prices at over $100 per ton of CO2 abated, I think there's, there's a lot of financial opportunity um, for ethanol producers that are able to sell their fuel in California um, to um, make lots of profits from putting, from putting CCS on their ethanol plants. Um, Oregon usually co copies California's rules. We also have a low carbon fuel standard in, Cal in British Columbia. Um, Calif or, uh, Canada is in the process of adopting an, uh, a national low carbon fuel standard that they're, they're trying to sort out right now. And even Brazil actually is, is in the process of, a, of adopting a low carbon fuel standard. Um, Sugarcane ethanol is another huge opportunity for CCS um, and for, for near term BEX deployment. Um, I think there's a lot less understanding of what the geologic resource looks like in Brazil, um, quite understandably. But um, it's, it's, I think it's definitely something worth looking at. Um, I mentioned before, these are the monthly um, LCFS credit prices. Um, I'm sorry this chart's about a year old, but I just want to point out that, again, um, the, the credit prices to pay a producer for a dollar of CO2 or a, a ton of CO2 abated in low carbon fuel standard is, is right around $100 per ton right now. And in fact, we've seen policymakers um, take the results of this work um, and policy advocates and argue that California can be even more ambitious in its low carbon fuels policy as the result of carbon capture opportunities on biofuels. Um, so this was a report that um, NextGen, Tom Steyer's group, put out along with the Union of Concerned Scientists and a couple of other advocacy groups arguing based on the existence of things like CCS on ethanol um, that California will be, well, will be well positioned to get past their 20% life cycle carbon intensity reduction by the year 2030 and get to an even higher target and to be even more ambitious in their climate policy. Again, because carbon capture and sequestration is available for them right now. Um, the last way that we can probably incentivize CCS on biorefineries is through renewable fuel mandates. Um, and um, unlike all the other optimistic things I've told you, this probably will not work. Um, the renewable fuel standard we have in, in the United States right now, which is a mandate to blend renewable fuels, um, mandates that all corn ethanol is, uh, is, is essentially gets the lowest credit price. It's, uh, it's counted as just a conventional biofuel. And because of that, there is no incentive for corn ethanol that installs CCS to qualify for the higher credit prices for the cleaner fuels that the, that the renewable fuel standard is supposed to um, bring onto market. And unfortunately, that's just the way that corn ethanol was defined when the law was written um, in, two, in uh, 2008 or 2006. Um, and so there's really kind of limited policy support in the federal renewable fuel standard for CCS deployment. Um, because um, all, the, all the cleaner fuels that we want to make happen, things like cellulosic biofuels, they already qualify for the higher credit prices, and adding CCS to them really doesn't, doesn't change that. Um, so unfortunately, um, we think that carbon intensity standards, we think that um, policies like the low carbon fuel standard, things like CCS tax credits are much better at driving this than, um, than the renewable fuel standard in the United States. Just one of the many failings of the federal renewable fuel standard. Um, so let me conclude. Um, you know, I th hopefully I've convinced you to today that low cost carbon capture and sequestration opportunities exist at biorefineries around the United States. And um, I'm really expecting to see kind of a large and growing market for these kinds of services in the United States. Um, with aggregation, and I think there are a lot of ifs there, but um, with aggregation, we think that integrated pipeline networks can make transport cost effective. 
Um, and we really think that near-term policy, combining these, these CCS tax credits with things like low carbon fuel standards and expanding low carbon fuels markets abroad, um, could really um, be sufficient to put about 40 million tons of CO2 underground from these existing biorefineries. And as I mentioned, that's about an order of magnitude more than we're putting in the saline aquifers worldwide right now. We put about 4 million tons of CO2 underground. Um, and I'll just end with kind of this last conclusion here. Um, I say that this financial opportunity can catalyze the growth of CCS, improve the life cycle impacts of conventional biofuels, and help fulfill the mandates of low carbon fuel policies across the US, and I'll say across the world as well. Um, the, last, the last thing I'll really say is that um, I hope that this can, um, to, use, um, to use Chris Mooney, the writer at the Washington Post, word, I hope this can kind of scramble the politics of how we think about developing new energy technologies in the United States. Um, he says, you know, the corn ethanol industry is a surprising leader for deploying carbon capture and sequestration. This is based on, um, this, was a, this was an article that came out earlier this week. Um, you know, I'm hoping that this can, um, raise the bar for creating lower carbon ethanol, raise the bar for starting to commercialize and develop um, BEX technologies, um, but then also help, um, I think, um, folks that are really resistant to the existing suite of biofuels that we have right now, um, understand that there is a process to make cleaner fuels, and there's a, an important role for bioenergy and carbon removal to play um, in near to medium term policy in the United States. Um, I have lots of other fun, um, information about running R&D programs that unfortunately we're not going to get to today because I'd love to take your questions. Um, but how about I stop there and um, thanks so much for listening. Any questions? Yes. Um, so the Credits just passed a few months ago, and it looks like from your work that there's potentially a lot of ethanol that could be economic now. And you're in Congress right now, mm -hmm. seeing what's happening. How much is how much discussion is there? Are people getting serious about thinking about how we can coordinate this and mm -hmm. make it actually happen, um, or is there like a lull period right now? Sure. Kind of yeah, I'll say I'll say, I'll say a few things. I think. Um, I think it was, a, it was a surprising coalition of interests that was able to get the 45Q tax credits over the finish line. Um, and you know, no one expected it to come in, in the FY18 omnibus. Um, you know, the head of, the, the, of Niori, this guy Brad Crabtree, he was like vacationing in Italy at the time when the bill passed. Um, people were not prepared for it. But I think there's a lot of momentum now. I think the Carbon Capture Coalition is... Um, is uh, excited, it's, it's, it's energized, I think it's building, it's bringing in more members. I think that uh, it is a little unclear exactly what the, what the next step is on CCS policy at the federal level. Um, there's one bill, uh, there was just a hearing on it um, in the Environment and Public Works Committee called the Use It Act. Um, sponsored by John Barrasso, a Republican from Wyoming, a chair of the committee, and Sheldon Whitehouse, a very liberal senator from, from Rhode Island. Um, it has some modest reforms to help things like CO2 pipeline permitting, sponsor some technology prizes for things like direct air capture and carbon utilization. But I think everyone thinks that's a pretty incremental bill. Um, I'm thinking about opportunities to develop um, and um, help finance these kinds of systems through the Farm Bill, um, to the extent that we might pass a Farm Bill in the year 2018. Um, thinking about things like uh, the biorefinery assistance program, the manufacturing assistance program, using things like loans and loan guarantees to pay for these compressors and these pumps at biorefineries. And there might be a small opportunity to bring that to carbon capture or to carbon transport equipment as well. Um, what I'd say we haven't figured out is two more things. Um, the first is what role CO2 pipelines are going to play in um, the um, hopefully off the record, the mythical infrastructure plan that we're supposed to pass through Congress this year. Um, it's very unclear what those bills will look like, whether they'll include things like CO2, uh, CO2 transport, or if it's really just going to be about building roads and bridges. Um, the Trump administration proposal was not taken particularly seriously by Congress, in part because of its reliance on private sector funding. Um, the House and the Senate are in totally different places, and I'm not sure we know exactly what an infrastructure bill will look like if we get one. I think the other place that really needs to be figured out is um, how we can um, speed up and um, expand um, 
um, classic well permitting. And this is the idea. These are the wells to, for permanent geologic sequestration of CO2. The EPA has issued like, something like one or two of them. Um, one of them is this, uh, the Decatur project in Illinois. But it, that is a, like a, a six to eight year process you know, be, um, to, to happen. And EPA is moving remarkably slowly. And I think there's a lot of concern that we're going to miss out on the opportunity specifically for saline storage because it takes a really long time to permit these, these, these class six wells. Um, now, the one exception to that is um, North Dakota was just granted primacy by the EPA to permit class six wells. And they're actually trying to build an ethanol plant with CCS in, North, in Richardson, North Dakota. It's called Red Trail Energy, I'd point it out to you. Um, and I think you know, they sell their, their, their fuels to the West Coast. I think they sell into the California market. Um, they're thinking really hard about um, doing CCS. And I think people like Heidi Heitkamp, the senator from North Dakota, are like over the moon about this ethanol CCS opportunity. Um, but I, I'm, I'm not sure what the right fe next federal step is and where things are going to go. That was a long answer to a simple question. Yes. Um, anyone else? Hey, Judy. They are. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I'll, say, I'll, say, I'll say a few things. So um, this project, um, really, it kind of took the existing infrastructure and the existing policies as fixed and looked at the opportunity to reduce CO2 emissions from existing biofuels. Again, we produce about 16 billion gallons of transportation fuels um, from corn ethanol in the United States. Um, there are real measurable CO2 emissions benefits from doing carbon capture at existing biorefineries. Um, if you believe the state of California's life cycle assessment, um, a kind of a modern natural gas fired, you know, um, corn ethanol biorefinery emits about 78 grams of CO2 per megajoule of transportation fuel. Oil is about 95 to 100. So it's a little bit better, 20% better, but nowhere where we need to be. If you, if you put CCS just on the fermentation, stream, what I was mentioning, the very low cost CCS opportunity at biorefineries, you reduce the carbon intensity score by about 30 grams per megajoule. So about a 40% improvement in life cycle carbon intensity improvement. Now that's not zero. You, need, you likely need cellulosic fuels to get to um, carbon neutral or carbon negative biofuels when you're capturing the CO2 from a fermentation process. I think of this as an opportunity to, um, again, reduce the carbon intensity and improve the environmental footprint of existing biofuels. Um, I think that if, um, I think there are, um, there are lots of very legitimate concerns about the impacts of corn ethanol production. Um, but I think at the same time, there are um, very real reasons to believe that even if we did things like re repeal our renewable fuel standard in the United States, um, you know, got rid of our biofuels policies, that we'd still be blending the same amount of ethanol. Into our, into our liquid transportation fuel supply. So I kind of take that as the counterfactual to look at this near-term opportunity. We're really, you know, we have this CO2 going into the atmosphere. We have these transportation fuels that are cheaper to produce than oil and will likely be blended anyways. Um, what can we do and how can we deploy new te technologies? That's the framing that I try to bring. Um, and it's, uh, it's certainly controversial. And judging by the comments I got that on the Chris Mooney article, um, I'm not sure I convinced that many people. Um. Yeah. I'm not a scientist, but I have uh, two comments. I think Professor Bob uh, Williams would have been very enthusiastic to listen to your wonderful talk. Two, uh, there doesn't seem to be much enthusiasm for pipelines these mm -hmm. days. Uh, and my other question is uh, how stable is it underground? Mm -hmm. uh, is it, do we need to put slurry walls around it? Does it leak? See, I can imagine like a big soda bottle, a pop bottle on the ground, and suddenly it's. Sure. Yeah, so I'll say a few things about both of those. Um, it is true, um, there is not much appetite to build pipelines um, in, the, in the United States right now, particularly on the left. I think we. Um, um, you know, quite, quite frankly, I think um, the, the environmental movement um, right now in the United States is really moving away from embracing any kind of cleaner fossil fuel infrastructure, um, including things like CO2 pipelines. I prefer to say CO2 transmission infrastructure, even though that is a mouthful, basically because it doesn't have the word pipeline in it. 
Um, but but I think um, this gets to really the kind of the broader politics here. You know, I'm part of the reason I wrote this and part of the reason I did this research when I was at Stanford is because I thought this is a story that California needs to know. This is a story that um, that people who are working on the ground every day to try to improve the uh, you know the economy-wide carbon emissions in California need to think about. Um, I think there is a lot of reason to be really optimistic about. Um, about um, decarbonization in the electricity sector with or without carbon capture and sequestration. But when you really consider kind of um, what we need to do to get to kind of century scale climate mitigation, the goals of the Paris Agreement, um, I think we're going to need to be building CO2 pipeline infrastructure. And, and part of this was really, again, to kind of scramble. I wrote this paper to scramble the politics of this issue. Um, as far as the CO2, um, what happens to the CO2 when you put it underground, um, it is an active area of investigation but it is not as active as you would expect. There is a mixture of um, what I consider to be kind of natural analogs, modeling, and um, observations from the, the 20 years we've been putting CO2 underground in places like Norway that suggests that we can either put CO2 safely underground for centuries or millennia, or we can tell when it leaks and stop it and mitigate the effects of when we know that happens. Um, that hasn't convinced everyone. And um, I would say that we know how to do um, tens, we know how to do hundreds of millions of tons of CO2 sequestration and it won't be a problem. When we're talking about billions of tons of CO2 per year, um, all bets are out. I don't think anyone knows what that's going to look like. Yeah. Rob. One of the problems with, with the aquifer storage is the liability issue. Yeah. The company Can you discuss that? Um, yes. So this is, um, again, it's a lot easier to prove things out on paper that work. And, and it's a lot harder to build things in real life, including building CO2 pipelines and including um, um, kind of CO2 storage liability. And so I'll, 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 say, I'll say two things. Um, one is that the permanence methodology currently proposed by California for the low carbon fuel standard, um, as it exists right now, it's going to require 100 years of post-well closure monitoring. And a lot of people think that's really going to deter investment. Um, particularly for enhanced oil recovery, um, but also for saline aquifer storage, because these are private companies that are going to essentially be on the hook to monitor CO2 post well closure for 100 years. And I don't think you find any company that wants to take on that kind of, um, that, that kind of liability for you know, getting low carbon fuel standard credits. Um, um, well, I think, and I think these conversations are just, we're just starting to have this. Now that, you know, we actually have a path to deploying CCS in the United States, I think that maybe, you know, maybe, maybe we figure out class six, maybe we figure out CO2 pipelines, and the last one has to be liability. I mean, ultimately, there isn't a great solution right now that exists. Um, and it's because of how we structure property rights in the United States, and we probably need something like Price-Anderson for CO2. We should talk more. <laughs> um, so I, I great presentation, and I, it looks like a, you know a nice way, as you say, to on the margin decrease mm -hmm. you know, net emissions in the U.S. Um, I'm wondering if if you were to replace kind of this like enormous patchwork of biofuels and climate relevant policies yeah. we have in the United States with something like you know the James Baker um, oh sure at all approach, you know, conservative approach, just like a carbon fee and dividend, get yep. all the rest of the regulations. Does something like this, if you're factoring in the land use change emissions and everything else, still pop out as a um, viable piece of the climate strategy going forward? It's a very good question. Um, I'll, say, I'll say two things. Um, one is that, you know, I think that even like the most elegant conservative, you know, carbon policy designs, um, you know, these, you know, these carbon taxes, these fees and dividends, they don't really, they haven't really figured out the land sector. Um, you know, there, it's remarkably hard to, um, to monitor, to estimate, and to model la land carbon impacts. And um, only because we have these tools known as life cycle assessment, and because we have people who care in designing climate policies, do we even consider these, these, you know, these upstream impacts? Um, because, um, and I think probably under any kind of fee and dividend or just you know, straight carbon tax, it, the land sector would likely be exempt um, right now. And that's, and that's unfortunate, and that's, 
But that also suggests, I think, um, I'm getting a little bit off on a tangent, but I think you know, we need to think really hard about how we design policy for the land sector, given that we likely need, we're going to rely on the land for remarkable amounts of carbon uptake and remarkable amounts of negative emissions over the course of this century. And we've barely gotten there. Um, I do think that if there was a carbon tax on transportation fuels, I do think that um, you know, biofuels, and particularly biofuels with CCS, would start to compete. Um, in part because you know, ethanol is a pretty cheap source of energy right now, um, you know, given where corn is and given where oil is. Um, and I don't expect that to change. The problem that we have is that um, we have no real driver um, for, um, for building risky, capital-intensive cellulosic biorefineries. And that's the problem we're all trying to solve in the biofuels world right now. Yeah, yeah. Because it takes a lot of fuel, fertilizer, transportation costs, trucks, you name it, to produce a bushel of corn. That's right. So this is, this is actually, so it's, it's this slide up here. This is what I was um, kind of trying to get at, but I, I glossed over it super quickly. Your baseline right there, it finds that when you, you plant, you fertilize corn, you harvest it, you transport it, you transport it to a biorefinery, you run a fermenter, and you need to burn natural gas for process heat. Um, the total process of making ethanol um, emits 78 grams of CO2 per megajoule of fuel. And that's a life cycle assessment metric. Yeah, so that's in there. This ethanol is not carbon neutral. I, I, I don't, no one, no one take, no one take that. This is not carbon negative either. It is bioenergy with CCS. It is removing CO2 from the air. But on a net basis, it still puts CO2 into the atmosphere to make, to make transportation fuels, ethanol with CCS. What happens here between scenario one and scenario two is that if you put that CO2 underground, you drop to about 46 grams per megajoule. So you're halfway to your zero carbon fuel, if you believe California's numbers. What is the <coughs> So um, I'll, put it, I'll, I'll put it this way. I think um, you know, on a wholesale energy basis, they're, they're roughly similar. There are some reasons why we want to blend um, ethanol at low volumes in gasoline right now. Um, it's a relatively cheap source of octane. Um, and it's also um, uh, it's an oxygenate, so it, 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 it reduces engine knocking, which is an important thing that we, you know, we, we put all kinds of additive, additives and fuels for. Um, I think that at levels under 10%, which is essentially what we've warranted cars to accept in the United States. Um, eth ethanol is cost effective to be blended in our transportation fuel supply. There are people who disagree with me, but I think there are lots of reasons to believe that. When you get above 10% is where it gets really complicated. Yeah? It's fun to follow up. You mentioned kind of that you don't think that something like this would really extend a lot more ethanol production. Like, what are the main drivers of yeah, so as far as ethanol goes, in the United States, um, we have this big problem of, of a blend wall where it is um, really hard to blend higher than 10% of our transportation fuels with ethanol because of um, the warranties on cars. I think over time, uh, we will solve that. We'll solve that with higher ethanol blends. We'll solve that with blender pumps. We'll solve that with maybe we'll build um, uh, engines that can take higher octane fuels and have higher compression ratios and are more efficient. Um, so you know, it's it's it it it's an open question. I think in, in two fronts. Maybe one, we can get to higher levels of ethanol blending, and two, we can we'll start blending more ethanol in, a, in other markets. You know, I think last week Japan agreed to start importing ethanol from the United States. You know, they want to start blending ethanol in Japan as well. So maybe it's not fair to say that we won't um, blend any, or create any more ethanol or that this couldn't drive kind of additional land use change or things like that. Do you have any more questions? And let's thank our speaker. Yeah. Thanks, guys.